What does test-driven development look like for a real-world project? There are a number of reasons why this is a tricky question to answer. But in this episode, I will show you some examples from a simple open source project that I'm working on for some tools to help with acceptance testing. That's our topic for today. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery and welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, why not hit like as well? Teaching TDD is rather tricky. The problem is, is that to teach the basics, it's much easier if we use simple problems in the form of coding carters to learn and practice the skills of uh, test-driven development. But that prompts the rather obvious objection that this is too simple and doesn't look like real world code. This is true, but there are two problems here. First, if we pick more difficult problems uh, to teach people with, then people get lost in the problem and don't focus on the test driven development. They miss the skills that they need to learn and practice test driven development. Second, one of the reasons that the code that people are so used to looks the way that it does and makes test driven development more difficult is because it wasn't written with TDD in the first place. And so it's inherently less testable than code that was built with TDD. TDD tends to encourage us to design more simply, and that's a good thing. As a result of all of this, I'm often asked for some real world examples of TDD. So I have some code that I think may serve. It's simple enough to explain, I hope, in a short YouTube video, but is real world enough as part of an open source project that I hope one day to complete to demonstrate some of the techniques of TDD in use. So here's some code. There's a link to a, a GitHub repo that contains all of the code that I'll be showing here today in the description below. One of the problems that I have with this open source project though is that the goal is to make the creation of domain specific languages to support automated acceptance testing easier. And while there are some useful things that help with that, they aren't really very complicated. So I'm never quite sure of the real value of these utilities, although I have rewritten versions of this code several times now. So while they may be simple code, they are also useful. I'm a big believer in the effectiveness of BDD style acceptance testing, but prefer the use of internal over external DSLs be built with tools like Cucumber and Specflow. My internal DSL acceptance tests look like this. The test is written in the programming language of the project, in this case Java, implementing my internal DSL to make writing tests like this easy this DSL approach works extremely well at abstracting what the software needs to do, its behavior, from how it actually does it, the implementation of the system. Partly through habit, partly because of some practical advantages to do with reducing coupling, I tend to build my acceptance testing DSLs to use strings to define the parameters. There's nothing inherent in this approach that forces us to work that way, but I find it makes things a little bit easier and I'm all for making life easier. We are extremely fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Transfic, Tuple, Honeycomb and Visual Assist. Equal Experts is a multinational consultancy built on applying the ideas and techniques that we talk about on the Continuous Delivery Channel all of the time to build great software for their clients. Transfic is a financial technology company that applies advanced continuous delivery techniques, again, like we talk about here, to deliver low latency trade routing services to some of the biggest financial institutions in the world. Tuple builds software to make pair programming easier for people to work remotely. And Honeycomb help engineering teams to deeply understand their own production systems through observability. Finally, Visual Assist is a highly rated Visual Studio plugin with features to enhance developer productivity. All of these companies offer products and services that are extremely well aligned with the topics that we discuss here every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering, or just for good software products, why not check out their links in the description below. 
So, if we're practicing my preferred version of test-driven development, where do we start? Well, I usually prefer to start with one or more BDD-style executable specifications, like this. Each of these tests represents an acceptance criteria for the feature that we want to build. These specs clearly define the goals for this feature, but without saying anything about how it's implemented. If you want to learn more about my recommended approach to ATDD, you can try my five-star rated ATDD training course that describes this approach in quite a lot of detail and how to do it. Or this free ATDD webinar that provides a useful outline, or this video on YouTube that provides a sketch of the approach. Test cases like this are the first layer of the four layer model that I recommend you adopt for automating acceptance tests. The idea is to make a clear separation of the specification from the technicalities of the test with the domain specific language and protocol driver layers acting as insulation and translation between the test cases and the system that we're testing. This separation of concerns in the test infrastructure design allows the test to be true even for a completely different implementation of the system. And even when the link between the test case and the system under test is broken by a change. So our test cases in the form of executable specifications for the system always define what the users want from it. The job of the next layer down, the DSL, is to make it easy to write these test cases. One way to make that job easier is to provide some default values for any variables in the DSL. This allows us to write test cases that very precisely specify every last detail when we care about every last detail, but also others that skim over the detail and have the test infrastructure automatically provide working default values for parameters that we don't really care about or need to think about in the scope of a particular test. This problem of parameter parsing is where the code that is the focus of the rest of this episode is aimed, allowing us to supply default values and a few other useful behaviors that we'll come to later. When facing a blank sheet and the need for a test, it's nearly always best to start with the simplest case that you can possibly imagine and use that to try out our initial ideas for the design of the interface to our code. TDD always works best with an outside-in approach to design, designing from the perspective of the user of this code, even when the user of the code is another piece of code. Here is my first test case. The arguments to my DSL are represented as named parameters in a string. So the simplest test that I can think of for my parameter parser is to return the default value for any given parameter when I haven't specified a value. The other interesting simple case is to return whatever I did specify for a parameter. And I certainly could have started in either place. But here I chose to start with the default value because it's slightly simpler. To be honest, that's the majority of positive cases for my parameters class covered with these two tests. But I've implemented test DSL infrastructure like this a few times before, so I have a few more ideas that I'd like to add. One of those things that I describe in some detail in my ATD training course is uh, based on one of the several approaches to test isolation that we explore. That is, how can we allow ourselves the freedom to run multiple tests against the same version of a system in parallel with each other, but prevent them from sharing data and so interacting with each other, which if they do share data is one of the surest routes towards unstable tests. Ideally, I'd like to be able to run the same test over and over again against the same running version of my system and get the same result every time. But there's a problem. The test might have changed the state of the system. So the second run of the test isn't in exactly the same state as the first. I can fix this problem with an idea that I call functional isolation to make the two test runs more independent from one another. But for that, I need to alias the names within the scope of the test. In my example here, the first time I run the test, every time my test uses the name of a book, in this case, continuous delivery, the system under test will see it as continuous delivery one, two, three, four. And the second time we run it, it will see it as something different. 
maybe continuous delivery six, seven, eight, nine. So now each test run is seeing a completely separate book. And so he's not sharing any data about that book. And so he's going to be more stable as a result. To achieve this, we need to be able to add the ability to alias the key concepts like the concept of a book in the test. So I want to add that ability to manage the aliases into my parameter parser. Here's my first test for that. I also need to check that I can alias two different things and end up with different aliases for each one. The obvious next step now is to be able to translate from a given alias back into the original name. This is a slightly more complicated thing because in the use case that I have in mind, two alias is going to happen in a very different place in the code to from alias. So I'm going to need some way of linking these two different places together with a shared collection of aliases. While I'm on that topic, how did I think up this use case? Well, I started writing my real acceptance test. To implement the create account entry for my DSL, I found as I wrote it that if account creation failed for any reason, I wanted to be able to generate a nice meaningful error message back to the writer of the test so that someone running the test could see clearly an error reported using the same terminology that they'd used in the test, rather than in terms of what we'd actually stored in the system under test using the alias. To achieve this, I needed to decode the alias. So I added a function to do just that, which I rather unsurprisingly called decode alias. Original, huh? I added that to my code and I returned to my unit testing to specify what I needed the new decode alias function to do. But I didn't write a test this function kind of test, or at least I tried not to. Instead, I thought about the scenario where I might need to use this and what that would look like in the simplest possible version. That simplest version that I could think of was that my code should return the original value when given an alias. Here I made a design decision that changed things a bit. I'm going to need to define some kind of scope within which I want the aliasing to be consistent. I assume that I'm going to need access to the alias information in different places in the code. At the bare minimum, when I create something that needs aliasing, and then again, when I need to translate something that has previously been aliased back to the original value. To do that, I've decided to add something into my design that I've called a DSL context. So each test instance will create its own instance of a DSL context. And that's where we'll store all these aliases and their mapping to and from names. So now, as long as we have access to that context within a test instance, we can always translate between the natural names and the aliases. This though changes the design a bit. Now I need my code to have access to this DSL context thing, something that I didn't think of initially. So now I need to modify the constructor of my parameters class to take the context everywhere I use it, which means I need to change the constructor in use in all of my previous tests. This is an extremely common and completely normal kind of change in TDD. This is an evolution of my design and so is nothing to worry about. As we learn more about what we want our system to do, it's perfectly acceptable to change our mind about things in our design and make those changes. The trick though is to make this kind of change as easy as possible. So in general, I tend to prefer refactoring IDEs like JetBrains that will make this change easy, automatically changing the code in all of the places where it's used. I also prefer, as you have seen, I hope, to keep my tests very small and as simple as I can, and so hopefully easily readable, and as a result of that, easily correctable if I do make a mistake. Here's how my code changed a result of this design revisit. Now that I have the concept of aliasing in place and working at a basic level, I need to further define what I want to do, defining more of its behavior. We fill the implementation detail in once we've seen the new test fail so that we can check that the test works. But to be honest, the implementation doesn't matter too much. We want it to be good, but 
our focus today is talking about test-driven development. So any implementation that makes all the test passes good in that context. So I will keep specifying new desirable behaviors with more tests. Let's leave my example at this point. If you'd like to see the code, you can find the link to my GitHub repo in the description to this video, as I mentioned earlier. I think that there are a few interesting ideas here that I hope this example helps to illustrate. And there are a couple of problems that I don't address at all, to be honest. Two of the most important facets of TDD, from my perspective, are working in small steps, trying things out and learning as we go, and that there's no real expectation that we're going to get things perfectly right the first time. We're completely comfortable that this is an exploration and that we will think of new things and change the code as we go. We want the freedom to change our minds. Both of these seem to represent a reasonably fundamental change to the way that people think and approach software development though, if they're not used to working this way. So these are key ideas to learn in your adoption of test-driven development. Both mean that we can start building code sooner, before we have all of the answers, and that we can be comfortable learning what might be better answers later as we go. We learn these new answers practically by trying things out rather than just by guessing at what might be a good solution. We can still use our design skills and experience to make the best guess that we can at any stage, but then we try it out immediately by writing a test. This way we lose nothing at all, but gain a lot. This is certainly a very simple problem, and so very simple code. But to some extent, this is a byproduct of working with TDD, not a requirement of it. You can certainly build complex systems this way, but TDD encourages us to write smaller pieces of simpler code and design it from the perspective of a user of that code, making the test simpler and more durable in the face of change because they focus on what the system needs to do rather than how it does it. Sure, there are times when we need to change the tests, but less often if we design from the outside in. The tricky problem that I have left out is testing things like databases and user interfaces. And the secret to that largely is don't, at least not within your TDD unit tests. I describe that in these videos so you can find more out about how to do that in there. Thank you very much indeed for watching. And if you enjoy our stuff on the Continuous Delivery channel, please do consider supporting our work by joining our Patreon community and particularly joining the very vibrant discussions in our Discord community. I'd also like to say thank you to our existing patrons. You help us to do the work that we do. Thank you very much indeed.